welcome to the Human Factors in Diving Conference and into Hall 2. Like I said, my name is Ray. I'm the room captain. And I would like to introduce um, Mr. Uh, Mike Mace, a military aviator, a flying instructor during his day job and during his side gig, a dive master. He's also an instructor in training for the human diver. So for these, some of these proceedings we do. So I'd like you to give him your undivided attention as much as you can, and I turn it over to him. Sir. Great. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me and we'll, uh, we'll get stuck in. Right, hello everyone and welcome. My name is uh, Mike Mason and for the next 35 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk to you about applying human factors to being a dive master and how I think it can make your dive mastering safer, but also much more rewarding and enjoyable. I believe that my background in military aviation combined with my other job as a dive master <coughs> enables me to offer something to the wider dive master community in terms of human factors, which is why I'm here talking to you today. Right, okay, the rest of the presentation. My aim for this is for you to come away from this realizing that as a dive master, there are lots of ways you can embrace human factors to make it easier for you and your divers to do the right thing, which means staying safe and getting more out of your dive mastering. I'll talk for a minute or so about my own background, which is very much shaped why I'm such a firm believer in human factors. Start with the why. As simply as possible, I'll explain to you why I think this whole topic is so important and useful to dive masters. The bow tie model is a good way to think about what you can do to prevent things going wrong, but if things do go wrong, what you can do to mitigate the impact. The world of human factors is pretty big in case you haven't realized. And uh, what I wanna do is highlight just a couple of specific areas or concepts that I think are both important and quite prevalent in dive mastering. I'm gonna use stories and case studies to help get the message across and demonstrate some of the issues. I'll round up by giving some direct human factors guidance on what you as a dive master can do, and then I'll summarize and take some questions. Okay, so moving on, me. Uh, my background, military aviation for over 20 years. I spent most of my time in the Royal Air Force flying, um, flying fighters, uh, but I'm also a flying instructor and supervisor, as, uh, as Ray mentioned. I'm now in the Australian Air Force and teaching people to fly the Hawk jet fighter trainer. I've also got a commercial pilot's license. And what all that really means is that I've been living and breathing human factors in my professional life for a very long time. Diving wise on the right hand side of that slide, I learned to dive in the Caribbean back in the late 90s and had a long break and I got back into it about seven years ago and never really looked back since. I've got about 300 dives in my logbook from all over the world. I'm a BSAC dive leader, a paddy dive master, and I work part time as a dive master for a local dive shop here in Australia. I'm also a, a rebreather diver and I'm working towards getting my rebreather trimix qualification. I came across the human diver a few years ago and it instantly resonated with me from my aviation background. I started training with the human diver last year and the more I learned, the more I realized just how much more there is out there to learn. I instruct for the human diver, um, as Ray said, and I do presentations like this one with a view to improving knowledge and awareness of what human factors are all about and how an awareness of them is definitely a good thing for your diving. Start with the why. Why does all this matter? Why do I think that dive masters that should be thinking about human factors? As a dive master, your role is to take people diving, some of whom may be very inexperienced, and you've got to do all that you can to make sure they stay safe and have a good time. As Gareth said in his first presentation uh, this morning slash evening, a good definition of human factors is that they're all about making it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. If you kind of overlay the dive master job description onto that, we could say that in this context, human factors is about making it easier for the dive master and their divers to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. And that's the main concept I'm trying to get across today and why I, th why I think it's so important to think about human factors as a dive master. What's the problem? Now, fortunately, as we all know, diving is statistically very safe, and most of the diving that dive masters get involved with is relatively shallow recreational diving, but it does come with its own set of challenges. And occasionally, people are injured or perhaps die, um, or perhaps unnecessarily, I, well, I finally feel, feel like I can under the supervision of dive masters. All accidents so incidents many little happen when several of... things come together to result in something big going wrong. Now, in isolation, those little things wouldn't be significant, but when they do combine and something does go wrong, it's easy uh, to look back with hindsight and see how all these things came together. But the point is, it obviously wasn't easy at the time, otherwise the accident or incident wouldn't have happened. So for me, the problem is that there are lots of potential small problems that happen a lot of the time that we can do something about before they combine to a big problem. 
Now, I don't know if any of you saw Diane Chadwick-Jones's um, presentation in Hall 1 before mine, but she talked about the conditions that, uh, that lead to human error rather than the errors themselves. And that's something I'm going to talk about as well, in perhaps not quite as much detail, but a lot of these problems are the actual conditions that encourage or promote human error rather than the errors themselves. And like I say, I'll talk about this more as we go along. Okay, so lastly, the how. How can we fix all these problems? We, we can't fix these problems completely, but there is a great deal you can do. Um, like I said, I'm going to use case studies and stories throughout this talk, as well as some of my own ideas, and give you some specific things that can help. Beyond these specific things, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, perhaps more generic non-technical skills that, again, Gareth um, mentioned in his introduction uh, uh, presentation. And these can help you solve those con complex problems that you don't see coming. Now, non-technical skills are things like communication, situation awareness and leadership. And the ultimate aim of those non-technical skills is to enable the people involved to have a shared mental model of what's going on. If everyone is more aware of their situation, then they're more likely to be able to deal with unforeseen problems if and when they occur. You don't know what's going to go wrong, but if you've got a good grasp of non-technical skills as a dive master, then you can get people working more as a team than as a group of individual divers. And that's going to give you a much higher chance of a successful outcome if things do start to go wrong. Right, to try and put this into real life, let's start with a story that involves um, in dive masters. A group of divers uh, surfaced after just under an hour and they found themselves a bit further away from the boat than they expected. There was a bit more current on the bottom than they predicted. They tried to signal the boat from a distance with whistles and DSMBs, but they failed to get themselves noticed and eventually just drifted out of sight. Now, some two and a half hours later, they came across an oil platform. They got out, made a phone call and were picked up by the dive shop boat and everyone lives to tell the tale. Brilliant. So let's try and put this story into the what and the how from the last slide. Firstly, what were the problems? Let's just look at three factors that were involved with the divers drifting out of sight. So it's more current than expected, the boat didn't keep a sufficient lookout, and the signaling devices, devices the divers had weren't sufficient either. Now, if you move just one of those, this would never have been an incident. Uh, if there was no current, they'd have surfaced closer to the boat, so wouldn't have needed a lookout or signaling devices. If there was a better lookout, they possibly have seen, been seen further away. And obviously, if they'd had the signaling devices, they could have been seen further away as well, or found with an emergency beacon or some such um, device. Look at the how to fix these problems. Plenty of specifics. You could have a surface marker buoy the whole dive or send up a delayed surface marker buoy um, early once you know that drift is expected so the boat can watch you drift away. You can make sure that lookouts have got a good vantage point and are especially active on the boat once the diver's surface to surface time has expired. You can take bigger DSMBs, you can take emergency beacons, you can take flares, etc. etc. Now, in terms of the non-technical skills, firstly, situation awareness could be improved by the crew on the boat accurately monitoring the dive time. And when the divers don't surface on time, they use all available resources to look for them. Secondly, leadership. And this is where it really comes in for dive masters. They're the leaders here. Make sure that you and your divers know what to probably expect, but also what to possibly expect so that you can all be better prepared. Now, this knowledge about what to probably and possibly expect is going to be largely based on your own experience but also what you learn from others. And that really reinforces the idea of, um, of a debrief, which brings us on to a relevant third non-technical skill, communication. You'll recall on the last slide um, that I talked about fixing the conditions that promote human error, rather than just trying to fix the errors themselves. In this case, in this story, like so many, having an open, thorough debrief after the incident to really dig into all the lessons and spread those lessons far and wide so other divers don't have to drift off and find an oil platform is definitely a good thing. This is all about reducing the exposure to those error-producing conditions in the first place. Okay, the bow tire model. So at the center of this model, we've got an adverse event. Now for dive mastering, that could be running out of gas or somebody getting tangled in a net or somebody having an uncontrolled ascent or like the last story we just talked about, drifting out of sight of the boat. Now on the left-hand side of the diagram, we've got all the defenses and barriers that we try to put in place to drive the probability of that adverse event uh, to zero. Now for dive mastering, that could be talking to other staff members or other divers about dive sites that you might not know as well, or doing a thorough brief, doing body checks, making sure any equipment you provide is fully serviceable and knowing how your diver's kit works. Now that last one might sound quite obvious, but I was working a few months ago and I had a customer with a, uh, an I3 BCD. And if you don't know the I3 BCD, rather than having the traditional hose over the shoulder um, to inflate it and deflate it, it's actually got a lever down by the hip that you push one way to inflate and one way to deflate. And the problem is if you don't do pre-dive checks and then you come across somebody with this uh, with an I3 BCD and you don't know how it works, it, it could make the difference between saving them or not if you don't know how to actually inflate their kit. But 
despite all these things we do on the left hand side to try and make sure nothing happens we're never going to drive the probability of an event to zero uh, humans are involved and so there's always the possibility of human error uh, human factors creeping in so on the right hand side of the model we assume the probability of the event is one and now we do all we uh, we consider all the things we can do to fail safely and reduce the impact of an adverse event when it happens so as a dive master, this could be uh, doing team emergency scenario training periodically, making sure your medical kit and oxygen kits up to date and that it's working, making sure you've got all the relevant next of kin details for those on board. Now, testing your emergency response plan periodically is a good idea um, as well. There's a story I heard about recently for some divers in Croatia and one of them got DCS and their plan was for a DCS casualty to be evacuated from the island by ferry rather than by helicopter. But they hadn't realised that the ferry only ran at certain times. So they now had to figure out what the next best option was. And obviously with COVID-19, are the nearby chambers even open? You know, an even bigger question. Can you get rid of human error? So with the Botar model, we talked about reducing human error. Can you get rid of human error? No, you can't. You, you can try to remove human error completely from a system, but it's pretty futile. It, it can't practically be done, especially in the world of diving. But as I've mentioned, the good news is you can change the conditions that promote human error. Now, this topic could be a brief all by itself. Like I say, Diane talked about it at length um, for a large part of her uh, presentation previously. Um, what I want to get out for dive masters, though, is just try and look at those specific ways to manage the environment you're in to try and avoid those human errors happening in the first place. Make sure you give yourself plenty of time to prepare things. When people need to pay attention, such as during a brief, avoid any distractions being present. Keep things as simple as you can so that people don't have to remember too many things. There's an infinitely long list of things to consider here, but it all comes back to that principle that I mentioned a while ago, making it easier to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. Okay, assumptions. When teaching people about human factors, you can expose the issues with assumptions. And then when you ask people what their key takeaways are, they'll often say, never make assumptions. But in reality, this is absolutely impossible and for good reason. So assumptions are one of the main reasons that we as humans can deal with life as the pace that we do. And it's no different with dive masters, obviously. Uh, I make an assumption when divers come into the shop I work at that they speak English. I make an assumption that if they're qualified divers, they can swim. I make an assumption that when I ask everybody to make sure they haven't forgotten anything before the boat leaves, that that is in fact the case. Now, if I asked everybody if they spoke English or if they could swim, I might get a few funny looks and I might even offend people. And if I asked everybody to show me all their equipment before we left the dock, it would take forever. And it would also um, uh, come across, potentially come across as patronizing and upset people. The key with assumptions is to know when you have to validate an assumption or when to get more information before making a critical decision. Now, by critical decision, what I'm talking about is one from which after the decisions made, there's no turning back. In terms of die mastering, um, an easy example would be if you have to do a negative entry from the boat. Now, a negative entry could be required if the die site has some surface current and you've got to get straight down and sink straight away. So you do a back roll off the boat with all the air dumped out of your jacket and you go straight down. If you've assumed that your gas is turned on, but it isn't, you're going to be in serious trouble very quickly. You won't be able to take a breath. You won't be able to inflate your BC or your dry suit. And the chances of a fatality resulting are pretty high. So if you're doing a negative entry or something similar, don't just assume that your gas is switched on. Uh, double check against your SBG that you can breathe in your regs, inflate your BC uh, or wing or dry suit. Check your buddy and make sure that they check you as well. This quote from uh, George Bernard Shaw, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that has taken place. And you see that all the time if you, if you think about it just a little bit. Now, a definition of good communication is an accurate exchange of information between two or more parties in a timely manner. For me, communication is the non-technical skill kind of glue that holds all of this together. We've all got our own thoughts and perceptions of what's going on, but to share those thoughts and improve understanding between the dive master and the divers, we need to communicate effectively. By doing that, it makes it easier to do the right thing and, and helps avoid those conditions that promote human error. The main part of communication for dive master is in their brief. And in my experience, most dive master briefs are okay, but in general, they're quite one way. There's lots of transmission of information, but relatively little checking that people actually understand. Communicating during the dive is limited for fairly obvious reasons, but there are definitely ways to do it better. Um, after a dive, something you hardly ever see from a dive master is a debrief. Now, these are the best way to learn about things that went well on a dive and things that went badly. I'll give some examples later on of how you can improve communication during, during uh, briefs, during the dive itself, and debriefs to improve your dive mastering. 
Right, another story. Uh, this story happened recently to a lady called uh, Mandy in Singapore when she was diving the local company that she, uh, she dives with quite regularly. Now, to provide a bit of context, there are only a few dive sites in Singapore and they essentially consist of relatively shallow reef with quite poor vis due to all the shipping and tidal currents that constantly stir at the seabed. The dive companies in Singapore, like many others around the globe, are struggling with COVID-19. There's fewer divers tri per trip, four down from eight, but the normal costs of staff, boat skipper, tank filling, they're all still there, plus all the additional costs of cleaning and sanitising that have to, occur before and af have to occur before and after every trip with COVID. The dive guides were also encouraged by the company to use any leftover air from previous dives to try and save on filling costs and avoid partial fills as much as possible. The dive master who's the subject of the story, a guy called Ray, had already been out that morning with another group of divers. Um, and for this trip, uh, for this trip out, he stayed away from the group until about five minutes before entering the water. The boat crew helped were helping the divers get their kit on for about the, the 40 minute boat ride to the trip out to the dive site. So a few minutes before um, they get in the water, Ray comes out, he appears and he gives his brief, which essentially consists of about two sentences, just talking about the location and the max dive time. Now, Mandy knows the area quite well, and she knows, excuse me, the lost body procedure is quite likely. So she asks Ray, what's the lost body procedure? And Ray says, well, sure, if you want to, we can follow the lost body procedure. Um, and that was all he said. So Mandy pressed him and said, well, you're the dive guide. Please tell us what you want us to do uh, if we lose our buddy. And Ray said, well, OK, just look around for a minute and then meet on the surface. OK, fine. So the brief's now complete and the group get in the water. There's Mandy, there's Ray and there's, and there's two other divers as well. And they're in the water and Ray says, just descend where you are around the mooring rope and we'll meet on the bottom. There's a bit of midwater current which catches Mandy by surprise and she gets um, detached from the group and loses the group. So she surfaces, um, she ends up waiting for about five minutes before Ray eventually surfaces and asks why she hadn't gone down the rope. And Mandy says, well, you didn't say go down the rope specifically. So, you know, whatever. Anyway, Ray and Mandy go back down the rope and they start the dive. And about 20 minutes in, Mandy sees a, a torch waggle through the gloom. So she goes over to it and she discovers um, that Ray has got the, uh, the alternate reg from one of the other divers in his mouth. They have bought the dive and on the surface, they discovered that Ray actually had never checked his tank after the first dive and ran out of gas shortly into this dive. So what can we take away from this story as dive masters? Right, so firstly, as the dive master, you're the leader of the group. On the way to the dive site, engage with the customers, make them want to follow you. Among other things, find out if they've got any concerns about the dive so that you can be better prepared to help them if they need it. Secondly, when giving the dive brief, if you miss something and somebody points it out, in this case, the lost body procedure, be humble and thank them for pointing it out, but do make sure you go over the details, obviously. Thirdly, if you do lose a diver, then follow the procedure you said you'll follow. If you said you wait one minute, then don't wait any longer. Procedures like this, they do exist for a reason after all. This also sets an example for others that procedures are meant to be followed, that they're not just optional, tempting as it might be. Now, lastly, even as the dive master, make sure you do your pre-dive checks with a buddy who's probably going to be somebody with less experience than you. And this does two things. Uh, it sets the example to junior divers that body checks should be done every dive, not just when you're a novice. And it also makes it more likely that you're going to get in the water with everything set up correctly and in Ray's case, have enough gas. We talked about changing the conditions that make human error more likely. So after the dive, something like this goes wrong, have a debrief to try and figure out the conditions that made it easier for these sorts of mistakes to occur. Now, COVID has definitely put a lot of pressure on the industry, and that's ultimately going to shine through as the individuals, the dive masters, the instructors feeling that pressure, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's repetitive activity, going to the same dive sites again and again. These things are all going to add up to make it more likely for dive masters to make mistakes, such as not doing a thorough brief, not checking the gear properly. Look at those conditions and what you can do to mitigate those. Uh, I read this story some time ago and it's written, um, it's written by the victim, but it also has some, some good lessons for dive masters, which is why I tell it. The victim, uh, Dave, he surfaced from a relatively shallow dive, no, no further than 20 meters, and he, he quickly started to feel some numbness in his lower extremities. Now, this numbness started to spread and Dave realized he only had um, perhaps seconds left to do some vital actions to save his life. So he fully inflated his wing. He put his alternate reg in his mouth, which had a bungee around his neck, so therefore was, was held secure and he kept his mask on. Now, shortly after, Dave was pretty much paralyzed, unable to move and was just waiting for uh, somebody from the boat to notice him. Now this happened, the dive master dived in, swam over um, to carry out a rescue. And in textbook fashion, um, took the reg out of Dave's mouth, took the mask off to check he was breathing and Dave was breathing. Great, everything's looking good so far. But the problem was the dive master got a bit um, excited by the adrenaline um, and didn't focus on the casualty, Dave, and didn't notice that he was dragging his head underwater while he was trying to listen to what the captain was saying from the boat. 
Now, Dave um, couldn't stop the water flowing into his airway and essentially started to drown. But the adrenaline of the situation actually provided a bit of a reprieve when they managed to get Dave back on the boat and they, and they dropped him face first. So all the water came out of his um, airway and he could breathe again. Brilliant. Uh, now, Dave survived, but he was initially diagnosed as a near drowning victim. The numbness, which was caused by decompression sickness, wasn't discovered for several days, which I think had some, some quite long lasting consequences. As an aside to Dave's actions, uh, I think his, his quick thinking to inflate his wing, get his bungee rig in his mouth were definitely really good decisions uh, and definitely helped save his life. Uh, but there's no mention in the story of him losing his weights. Now, I think when we go through our training, it's one of the first skills we learn on an open water course. And yet dive accident statistics are littered with examples of people getting to the surface and then sinking again with their weight belts still attached. So as the dive master, make sure you know how to get rid of your diver's weight belts in a hurry. It's, it's one of the most important parts for buddy check. So from a dive master point of view, what can we take from this? For me, it's all about the rescue. We do our rescue courses. We do our dive master courses. We do our first aid training every year or so. But it's really rare to actually go through scenarios every so often and run those end to end drills to practice what to do when things go wrong. You don't expect this is why pilots do emergency simulators um, every so often. It's to help make sure that when things do happen for real, they're much more likely to be able to, do, to, to be able to deal with the adrenaline and make good decisions. It makes it easier to do the right thing in a real emergency. I strongly encourage organizations that employ dive masters to run drills for their team every so often to get people thinking and training outside their comfort zones. It's only by running these sorts of exercises that you really figure out what works and what doesn't. Is your emergency oxygen plan valid? Does everyone know how to use the emergency oxygen? How do you operate the radio on the boat if the skipper's busy? How are you going to get an unconscious casualty back on the boat? Is the nearest chamber open? Like I say, something serious to consider in COVID. Run through some drills for half a day, for a day, put people in different positions. And then once it's all over, run a really thorough debrief to try and gather and share all those lessons around. It's all part of the right hand side of the bow tie model, helping you fail safely. And days like this, they're actually quite good fun if they're, if they're run well. This is a story that was on one of the uh, Facebook groups a few weeks ago, told by a dive master called Martin. The group had just done their third dive of the day. And when they were back on the surface, one of the guests dropped their camera over the side of the boat. Now, Martin, being a diligent, enthusiastic dive master, quickly decided that he'd chase the camera, believing that he had enough air. However, he had to go all the way to the seabed, which was actually just shallower than 40 meters. He didn't realize that at the time. Um, so on the way back up, his computer told him he's got to do a few stops. And that obviously started to chew into his already depleted gas supply. And he probably would have emptied his tank had another a member of staff not come down to meet him at the five meter safety stop. Now, the outcome was good in that Martin rescued the camera. But all it needed was a few more little things to go wrong and he could have easily had an out of air scenario or, and or decompression sickness or potentially worse. This could have been an example of outcome bias. Now, Martin could have said the outcome was fine. Therefore, the processes were fine because he survived with the camera. But to his credit, he actually tells the story as an example of what not to do, which is good. Now, a lot of people in response to the thread said they wouldn't go after the camera, that the customer should have known better. And that was that. But I, I just don't think it's that simple. Uh, there are there's things to consider, right? So how expensive was the camera? How deep was the water? As two initial um, questions, if it's a disposable piece of cheap camera and it's 100 meters, then everyone's probably just going to laugh about it and think nothing more. But if it's a top of the range Nikon with an expensive housing, loads of strobes and the picture of a lifetime from the dive you've just done and the water's only 10 meters deep and crystal clear, then the owner's probably going to want to have a go at getting it back. And I'd certainly have a go as a dive master in that situation. Now, I appreciate those are two um, relatively extreme examples, but there's a lot of gray in the middle and that's really common in diving. When is the risk of doing something too big? This is a dilemma that dive masters face all the time, perhaps unwittingly. They get to a dive site they've been looking forward to all week, but the conditions are marginal, but they know it's going to be full of fish and the customers are going to love it. So they press on anyway. That's an example of what we call plan continuation bias. Now, maybe they'll have a great dive, but maybe somebody gets hurt. And with hindsight, oh, it was obvious the conditions weren't right for diving. Now, like I say, dive masters are exposed to this sort of uncertainty quite often, but ultimately they want to go diving and give their customers a good time. So when things are looking marginal, it's definitely worth thinking about and emphasizing the what ifs. Think back to the bow tie model. In bad conditions with bad viz, it could be more likely than normal that you're going to get separated underwater. So on the left hand side of the bow tie, strongly encourage everyone to stay close than they normally would to help avoid getting split up. But then on the right hand side of the bow tie model, make sure that everybody does understand the body separation plan. So if you do get split up, you can sort things out efficiently without anything further going wrong.
Now, in this particular case, with Martin and the uh, the lost camera, I'd suggest something to think about. There's something does go over the side, and you're not fixed in one spot, and, you're, and you can't see the bottom. Then just get the scripper to quickly press the uh, the man overboard marker because that won't send out a ping straight away. You have to confirm it, but it will plot an instant position on the GPS that you can then come back to for a proper search, and that gives you options um, of conducting a uh, uh, making a better effort for get, getting a diver ready to, to do a proper search and recovery operation. Okay, let's look on to some specific ideas. Now, these next few slides aren't exhaustive, but I want to give you some specific practices to use that can help with human factors. And hopefully they give you some things to think about and maybe develop some ideas of your own. So before the dive, what can you do before the dive? Personal introductions. This is all part of the foundations of psychological safety. And that's a whole topic on its own, but it's to do with people within a team feeling safe and comfortable talking about things that they aren't happy with or sure about. So when you meet your customers at the start of the day, greet them with a smile, maintain eye contact, start a conversation, tell them your name, that you'll be their dive master, Give them a way of remembering your name if you can. We're all pretty crap with names, let's face it. I've got my name um, written on my cap, which I point out to people. Name badges are pretty useful if you've got them. Obviously ask for their name so you can treat them as a person rather than just uh, another customer. And make sure that they know they can come to you with any questions or concerns that you have. You are there ultimately to make sure they have a good time and a safe time. Uh, personal story along the lines of this kind of theme, I'm hopefully doing a trimix course in New Zealand in January if the border opens again. Um, and when I first started discussing the course with the instructor, Pete, a few months ago, he just, you know, messages were going back and forth. And one of the messages just just said that he was really looking forward to doing the course with me. And I just sort of thought, oh, that's brilliant. And that just, you know, really psyched me up as well to look forward to it. Just that one little message had such a profound effect. Check people's gear, especially if it's their own gear rather than higher gear, because you probably know how the higher gear works. You want to know how their gear works. Think about my story with the I3 BCD a few slides ago. Where are the dump valves? How do you get rid of people's weight? How do you inflate their BCD? Now, make sure you tell the people what you're doing first so they don't just think you're double checking them because that's probably going to cause offense as well. You need to ensure that they know you're doing it for both of their benefits. A good time to do this on a boat dive is when you're on the way out to the dive site. Uh, and you've often got not much else to do. And it's, it's also a good way to start conversations with people as well and build that rapport up with your team. Now, like I said earlier, most dive master briefs are relatively one way. So try and engage your audience. Start off by asking who's been to the dive site before. If it's everyone, there's no point in doing a detailed site description. Ask people which hand signals mean what. Um, a good one to check is to do with gas amount and what they're going to do if they've got, or what they're going to show you if they've got 120 bar. You might get, um, you might get T2, you might get one, to zero. Different agencies teach different things and it's obviously better to sort this out on the surface beforehand. As part of the brief, make sure that people know that you're going to want some feedback after the dive so that if they do find something that they're not sure about or don't like, they're more likely to just make a mental note about it and, and talk to you about it later on. I would encourage you to brief from a checklist. That way you're far more likely not to miss anything if you get distracted during the brief and have one of those where was I sort of moments because let's face it, we've all had those when you get interrupted at the wrong time. Set the example. This is a pretty common theme today. Uh, be the dive master you want to follow. Do your checks with a buddy and make sure that other people see you doing them because they're likely to follow you if they see you um, doing the right thing. Okay, during the dive. What can you do during the dive? Closed loop communications. And this is to do with making sure you've understood a message by repeating the message back. So when somebody gives you a hand signal for how much gas they've got, repeat it back to them. And also you can try saying, saying that amount to yourself through your reg. And if you do this for 10 people, you're far more likely to remember who had the lowest amount as it engages more parts of your brain rather than getting to the last person and forgetting how much the first person had, which I have done before. Now, this concept of uh, closed loop communication applies to every hand signal. Go up, safety stop, whatever. Try and encourage your divers not just to repeat or not just to respond with an OK symbol. Just repeat whatever the signal uh, back was that you gave them because that person may be looking elsewhere for a moment and not seeing your signal. If they're going to give you something back, a head nod or an OK, it might as well be the signal you just gave them rather than, um, rather than just something simple. I said this would be a theme. Set the example. When you enter the water, try and do it by the book. For a giant stride, make a show of looking out of the horizon and taking a big protracted step out. When you're exiting the water, make an example of keeping your reg in or snorkel in and your mask on until you're back in the boat. Again, plenty of stories out there about people getting into trouble uh, with waves after being on the surface and taking the reg out or mask off early. If you do it, if you do it as the dive master, then people are likely to mirror you. Take notes. This is something to think about. Um, taking wet notes, it, it serves two purposes. Firstly, if you see something you aren't happy with, such as someone's fins constantly touching the coral or someone with a poor body position, then you can make, uh, make a note to discuss it with them afterwards. And secondly, if you see lots of interesting wildlife, you can write it down to help people with their logbooks later on. 
I'm no marine expert and I often see little nudie branches where I dive in, in Australia that I don't recognize. Um, the other day I was diving with a buddy and he pointed out a fish that I thought was a frogfish just hitting its little cubby hole. But I wasn't sure. So I made a, I made a note um, to ask him afterwards. And afterwards I found the note and said, oh, what, what was that? Was that a frogfish? And he said, yeah. And the good thing was he told me that they're often in that spot and so now that's helped me as a dive master with future customers provide them a better service by finding you know something unusual and cool that's uh, that, that we can find okay after the dive have a debrief this doesn't have to be a long drawn out affair if the dive is completely uneventful then it can be enough just to make sure everybody is feeling well and they had a good time during the debrief is where you ask for feedback do all that you can to make people feel comfortable giving you constructive criticism. If you get some feedback, then say thank you. And at the same time, from those notes you've taken, you may want to ask someone else if they'd like some feedback. Now they might say, no, thank you, in which case you just move on and that's it. But most of us do actually want to get better at what we're doing. So if they say yes, then offer them some advice on how to improve based on what you observed. Now, a little tip here is to make the feedback about the behavior rather than the individual. For example, don't say, right, Dave, your fins were constantly in the coral. You need to lift your fins up. Say something like a horizontal position with fins up is much better for the coral. Now that way you're explaining the same concept, but are making it about the technique or the behavior rather than about Dave personally. Again, set the example. If you've done something wrong, no matter how minor, just talk about it. This shows that you're humble, it shows that you're human and it encourages other people to speak up as well. I did a dive a few months ago with a relatively big group and it took me longer than I expected to get back to the anchor line. Now this meant that we surfaced a few minutes over time and my buddy had just under 50 bar, which was against the standards I'd set at the start. So I went and spoke to him afterwards and I apologized for the violation. I reflected on it and I considered that in future with a big group at the same site um, or similar site, I need to allow more time to get back to the anchor line to avoid breaking the standards. If you do get some feedback, act on it. And if possible, show that you've acted on it. So if somebody says they'd like to have heard something in the brief that you didn't cover, change your brief to cover it in the future, especially if that person is a regular and they're going to hear your brief again. It might be the case that somebody offers you uh, feedback via email or so a day, a day after the dive or whatever. Now, if that happens, just take two minutes to reply saying thank you for the feedback. So often that kind of thing just disappears into the ether and those who spent time writing that email have got no idea what happened to it and they're, they're less likely to give feedback in future. I've personally sent a few emails to, um, to dive companies uh, with a bit, bit of feedback after the trip. I've never had a reply, which I, have, which I find quite disappointing. Okay, we are almost there. Remember, human factors, it's about making it easier to do the right thing. Consider the bow tire model when you're doing a dive in terms of what you can do to prevent things going wrong in the first place, and then what you can do when things do go wrong to prevent a worse outcome. Whether you're planning a new dive site, brief one you've done many times before, actually doing a dive or reflecting on a dive you've done, look at the conditions present and not just the errors themselves. Was there enough time for a, uh, a thorough briefing and pre-dive checks? Was effort made to engage with the novice divers in the group to make sure they were completely comfortable with the dive that you're about to do? If you have a, a real life rescue situation, but you've not done any rescue training as a team before, then you shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't go very well. Nobody has all the answers. Uh, maintain a curious attitude and seek to continue learning throughout your entire dive mastering career. Ask why, why people do things a certain way. Look for those different points of view. You've got other people, you've got social media, books, magazines, podcasts, so much information out there to, to learn from. And obviously keep doing courses to uh, expand your technical skills as well. Validate critical assumptions. We cannot do things as quickly as we do without assumptions. But when it comes to critical things from which there's no turning back, make sure your assumptions are valid. Assuming your gas is turned on when you're doing a negative entry is not necessarily a good idea. Communication for me is an art. It's the glue that brings all of this together. As a dive master, really engage your audience in the brief with some two-way communication so that you understand them as well as them understanding you. It's a two-way thing. Now, finally, the uh, the last point, I said this loads during the presentation, set the example, do your best when demonstrating technical skills, when briefing, when doing checks, engage with people, smile, maintain eye contact, be enthusiastic, but be humble and admit your mistakes. Enjoy what you're doing and show people that you're enjoying it. Be the dive master you would want to follow. Okay, thank you, I'll uh, take some questions. Fantastic, thank you, Mike. That was really a nice presentation. If anybody has a question, then you can go into the section on the left side of the screen that says, I have a question and park yourself there and we can invite you to the stage. 
Until we get some questions, Mike, I do have a question for you. Okay. Well, a few questions for you. Go so, ahead. according to your pictures, you've been flying F-18s. That is right. Yes, I have. I've got about six hundred hours on F-18s. Yeah. Fantastic. I used to I used to work on F-18s and I used to work on A-4s before that. Wow. So my, hi my, my, my history, my background like yours is a military one and I've been listening to human factors both in the military and in commercial aviation. So there you go. That's right. Very nice. So, as, so as a professional, what do you do about the dive masters who have been around for years and are reluctant to, what would your suggestion be to the dive masters who have been around for years who don't see a need for human factors in their performance? I think with, uh, with these kind of people, something to bear in mind is that whenever you're trying to get a concept across to anybody who you have a, um, you think they might not, they might not buy into it, then it, whatever you do, don't come across as preachy. Don't try and tell them it's the way to do it. Um, I don't know if anybody listened to Gareth's uh, talk at the start, but he, um, one of the things he said was that when he'd done his report a few years ago about try, about instant reporting in the UK with Paddy and feedback and stuff. Not music, not, not me. Good, <laughs> Um because he'd sort of had a direct a direct attitude people rebelled and it's taken him years to kind of get over that so all i would say is uh if you're trying to get if you're trying to sell a message to somebody don't come across as preachy because you're just going to push them further away especially if you think they're going to be skeptical um and it, that applies even more if you're the, the junior member of the conversation with it, sort of an old and bold dive master there are um several approaches you can try and i think the first one and probably the best one is if you think you can do something better then uh ask if you can have a go at doing it. So for example, if you think the dive master in question doesn't do a very uh, a very good brief or has got a very sort of old school one way brief, then ask if you can give the brief and then um, and do the brief, make make the effort to make it interactive, ask lots of questions, ask for feedback. And then afterwards, ideally when within earshot of this dive master, you know, talk to some of the customers and say, did you like that brief? Was it good? Was, was it bad? Did, was it different? Was it new? Um, and hopefully, uh, people do give you positive feedback and say the brief was good and then the message kind of gets across to the old and bold dive master that way around so he kind of gets a sort of he thinks oh, okay maybe mike's got a point that's actually quite a good way to do business so nice. don't preach just try and use um subtle methodology as it were to get the message across fantastic and we have a question from philip m so philip the stage is yours hey phil hi mike um great talk thanks <laughs> thanks very much and i had a lot of this stuff you were talking about really you know uh, the things we've talked about um mm. in the online course and things aren't they um yeah. but yeah one of the, the thing it's more a comment really the thing that sort of resonates most with me and i think the thing that if there's dive masters watching this um one of the big takeaways from my experience as a diver on, on trips where there was dive masters leading is this sort of thing you were saying about being humble, um, you yeah. know, be, having, having that sort of attitude where you um, bond with the people who are, who are your guests, especially when you're doing, you know, week long liverboards and things like that, where you're going to be with the people for, for a period of time. Um, the, the worst experiences I've had with dive masters have been as much about their attitude and how they came over. And, and to be honest, I've been on trips that, where the dive masters had, and they, they had lots and lots of issues, um, that could have been awful trips, but because the dive master's attitude was humble and, and they were willing to take advice and actually let the people in the group work with them as a team um they actually came away as being great trips because because of that sort of difference in attitude um and i think it is it's something that people that dive masters need to realize is that they're not just sort of a boss um you know that they uh, that they can sort of you know, demonstrate that they do make mistakes and things like that um yeah. And yeah, and the other thing, the 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 example, obviously, being an you know being in the underwater photography business, the example about the photographer was, I I actually have a friend who who had almost exactly the same thing, except they went back in for their own camera that they'd lost under the boat, and they actually got a bend 
um, right, because okay. they they had to back they basically did a bounce dive with not enough air to do um any sort of deco stops and things and and shortly afterwards got a bend so this is something we teach in our workshops is is like don't go back in after your camera you know plan a dive to go in and get it or, or you know the dive master needs to plan a dive to go and get it so yeah did you think the obviously i gave that little bit of advice there phil about the press the man overboard marker just to plot the position is that the kind of thing you would you would or you've obviously lived in this situation um personally or so one of your friends has with that did they decide that could have been something that they could have done with hindsight yeah yeah i mean that's something that um i've, I've heard you know I'd, it's something we sort of again uh mention i mean the other thing that we sort of teach that is 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 that no matter how expensive your camera gear is it, it you know you you should minimize risk um and and it is that matter of like can you come back and get it um and literally you know i've been on a trip where someone lost the camera on a night dive and and nobody there was extreme current and they waited until the next day to go back and get the camera and managed to get it back but it is that kind of thing of, of it, it is just a camera it's it, you know it's not worth your life it's not worth the dive master's life to get back no. a camera get insurance is the thing that one of the things we say to people as well yeah um, but yeah cool thanks phil any uh any other cool. questions or comments right yeah i don't see any else in the question group but I do have another question well, for we've you. we've got Chris ready to go. Yeah, I've got, oh, I've got a question. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry I didn't see you there, Chris. Please. <laughs> hey, Chris. No, thanks, Mike. Um, hi. Mike. Um, yeah, so actually I'm not a dive master, but I often end up being a de facto dive master by virtue of you know, having probably the most dives. And, and it, you know, it occurs to me that sometimes that's uh, an expectation that is uh, often you know, assumed by the boat, the boat uh, skipper, and it's only because you know I I have you know a background like yourself in in human factors and, and military aviation that I'm able to sort of uh, convert myself into a dive master, so to speak, and and apply those those sort of learnings, and and often I think you know sometimes boat charterers. Um, who don't often dive with with dive masters as part of the crew um, often have this expectation that the the, the customers just going to sort themselves out, and I, I think that's often a an unreasonable assumption. I, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, there is the, there, it's, there was the um, there was the. Uh, something in, in one of the facebook groups recently to do with the uh, accident off um off cape wrath where you know the boat skipper was had sort of said he was just a taxi driver and it's the, it's the divers yeah. are up it's up to them to do what they want but yeah as you say it, it's not quite that simple and i think there needs to be a lot more um it's frustrating because you've got like le the legal system would like to put hard lines in the sand the human factors reality the, the messy world of diving like that gareth talked about earlier it's it's not quite that simple and it does take a bit of you know humans managing safety actively all the time and trying to do the little little things to to, to result in things not going wrong it's it's difficult but it's um yeah you have to kind of do what you can with it with the cards that you dealt i guess yeah thanks mate my pleasure okay i don't see anybody else in the question list. I think We've Darryl. got Daryl ready to go. You're too fast, man. You're too fast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Daryl. Mm, Daryl might have some connectivity issues. Keep yeah. trying, Daryl. Your image is a little bit static, Daryl. There's no audio coming through. Not going to happen. Ray, take it away. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll see if Daryl can maybe do something about his connectivity speed. So another question for you as a dive master. 
what are your responses to a customer who does not follow your instructions? So if you've got somebody who is, uh, yeah, not doing what you want them to do, a good way to do it is, to, or a good way to get them on board with your way of thinking or what you want them to do is to try and tell a story. So again, put it in context. Um, if you can say to somebody, right, I don't want you, I need you to follow me. I need you to stay close to me because um, there are some danger, there are some quite strong currents around. And if you get too far away, you might get swept away. And that's something else that's quite useful. The um, the word, because it's, it's quite a powerful word. You can say, I need you to stay close to me because the visibility is quite bad here, because the currents are quite bad. I need you to stay uh, in single file behind me against the wall, because if you don't, you'll scare the sharks and ruins the dive for everybody else. Um, that's the use of the word because can help can help um, very much so as well as uh, t as well as telling a story. Uh, something else to consider is uh, what's called the pace model. So that's to do with uh, it stands for probe, alert, challenge, and then emergency. And the idea is if somebody isn't doing what you want them to do or you don't think they've quite got the message, you can just sort of say. You can start with P for probe and you can say, do you want to just think about maybe doing this because it's probably a good idea? And if they still don't get the message, then you can say, look, I really think you want to be doing this because if you don't, then there's a risk of us of us getting separated. Uh, if they still don't get the message, then you start escalating even more and saying, look, I really need you to follow me. Uh, and ultimately, if it gets to the extreme E emergency, you can say, right, I'm sorry, but your practices are unsafe. We're not diving anymore. So use that kind of softly, softly, but escalatory, escalatory approach to try and get the message across to people to see if they can, uh, uh, to get them to follow you. Tell a story, start softly, but ultimately you, you have to reserve the right as a dive master um, for safety. Or if people are, um, uh, if it's affecting other customers' experience, then you have, sometimes you might just have to say, right, no, um, you can't dive with me. Good. Yeah, fantastic. I don't see any other questions inside the the list, but I thank you for the answers. They're I'm very sure. informative. Tell me. So, so far, so good, gang. The unfortunate truth is Daryl's connection just keeps not being stable. And so yep. with that, unless we've got any other questions, Daryl's trying again and it's just not going to work. <laughs> we've got about three minutes left. And so any other questions or we can certainly take Mike and go out to the table and you can interact with him more. Uh, and get ready for Laurel Moroni in just a few minutes. So if anybody has any other questions, Mike, I invite you to the uh, Human Factors in Diving Conference lobby area. And there's an area there that says for the last speaker in Hall 2. And that's where you can park yourself um, for a little bit. If there's anybody that has any questions for Mike, you can find him there. And you can have a, a discussion as long as you want as long as he'll entertain you. So other than that, we can wrap this up. Perfect. All right. Well, I will head off and uh, be waiting at the aforementioned place in the lobby. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. Yep. See you later. Everybody yeah. else, we'll start at top of the hour with Laura Maroney from